Had to Leave Your Bride, and, I, and the name of the song is Blues Stay Away From Me, a 1949 song from the <coughs> Delmore Brothers. One thing that is important in the South that we haven't <coughs> talked about, George, was the tobacco. And tobacco is certainly not as important today, but when you were growing up, just about everybody worked in it, didn't they? Tobacco was the major cash crop in Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky area. And so the majority of cash flow that a farmer would have would be from growing and selling burly tobacco. And of course, the whole family worked in, in the crop and uh, one of the worst experiences one can have is to be a youngster on a hot August day when you cut the tobacco with a knife down low and you spear it onto a wooden stake about five a, or let's six Let's get that stalks. picture up because people need to realize how yeah, big yeah. it is. Yeah, there, it's as big and, as a human being. And they're heavy. The stalks are heavy. They can be as much as 30 pounds per stalk. And so anyway, you spear four or five of them on a stick of wood and then you lay them all on a wagon and pull them back to the barn and you hang them in the barn, you know, spaced out maybe six inches apart so that they will air cure. And then that goes on for, I don't know, Uncle Stan, two or three or four weeks, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. And then the tobacco, what we called at that time, comes in case, which means the moisture is such, <coughs> excuse me, that you can work with it and grade it. Work and grade it. So it sounds like <coughs> some differing levels of quality. Mm -hmm. So we've got, we got crops out here that are like that, but we don't grow tobacco out here. At the same point in time, though, surprisingly, at the Port of Seattle, which is a huge economic engine for this area, one of the major exports from the Port of Seattle in the past <coughs> decade has been tobacco, coming from other, other markets for sure. Um, but people don't work very much in tobacco these days, do they? No. Just to make me sick or not dog to work, get up in that hot barn and they would hand all the six of tobacco up to you and all that tobacco smell would waft up there and, and I'd get so sick, you know, I'd just, I'd be nauseous. Hmm. So I guess one thing that you probably wanted to be able to do was listen to the Mockingbird and that is the name of a song from pre-Civil War, 1855, Septimus Winter wrote this song. So let's go to listen to the Mockingbird right now. I want to go to a picture, and this is a picture from the Appalachian Museum in Norris, Tennessee. It's a picture of you two. And it seems that you are carrying on the tradition <coughs> of, uh, of playing music together. And my question is, the, the tradition, how important is, is the music, the, t the telling of stories through music in the Smoky Mountains? That is a very, it's a, it has been there since people have been there. So uh, the people do not want to let go of playing music. And George, you know the history really, really well, and that it comes actually from Europe, doesn't it? 
most of the music in the Smoky Mountain area where we're from came from either England or Scotland in that area. And the people there were reasonably isolated for about 100 years almost with very, uh, in a few, very small influx and, and outflow of folks. And so the music that came from England and Scotland was transformed by the people there telling their own stories and putting them in their own words. So they, uh, you go to Scotland and you watch the dances there, they're almost exactly what I grew up with. And the music is very similar. It, is it what happened, because I know that you're an historian as well, and, and is it that the, the people, they, they landed on the East Coast, and whether it was Virginia Dare or whoever it was that landed there, then they came west, and when they got to the mountains, they stopped? Uh, the, the Royal Judith of London landed in Philadelphia, and the, there were three Emirates on that ship in 1731. And then they kind of, you know, they worked through the Civil War, or, or the Revolutionary War. There was an Emirate physician on Washington's staff, and they came down through Virginia. They were given land grants, some of them, and some of them wound up in East Tennessee. And then a few left there in later years, and there are some in Oregon, some in Texas, some here in Washington. So they spread out quite a bit. And of course, the spelling of the name is a little bit different. Uh, some of them with two M's and some of them with one, but it's all from the same family. And some without the R and some with two T's. Oh, and the picture you showed earlier of Emmert's Cove, that's actually, there's actually a, an Emmert graveyard there. Uh, and I think the oldest person there was like 17, 52 or 1770, something like that. So hmm. it's... Uh, Frederick. Little, yeah, Frederick Emmert. Well, we're coming down near the end of the show. And one thing, though, is that you just can't get away from the mountains. And so even though neither one of you live in Tennessee <coughs> anymore, Dad, you live within an earshot of the mountains. And George, we, you live right in the mountains out here in Washington State now. Yes, and the ones in Tennessee are still in my heart. Washington mountains are in my heart, too. So are the Tennessee ones. Well, so I think we just need to get right down to it. Let's get to Carry Me Back to the Mountains, and that'll take us out. I'm 